Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with me today. Hope you had a great weekend and that you were in church Sunday. If not, please go to our website, fbcrockhill.org, and watch the live stream from this past Sunday. Today, for our devotion and our Bible reading plan, we are in Romans chapter 11, which is um, kind of the climax of the conclusion, if you will, of, of, of some teaching that Paul has been doing through the previous 10 chapters. And today's devotion will be a little bit longer because this is a very important chapter to understanding the theology in the book of Romans. And so what I want to do is kind of summarize what he has said, what he's taught us up through the previous 10 chapters. So the conclusion in chapter 11 makes more sense. And because I don't want to ramble but make certain I give you the key points. I'm going to look at my notes a little more than normal because I, th- I just think this is really, really important. I don't want to miss anything or drag it out either. What he's taught us so far in the first 10 chapters of Romans is that everyone, Jew and Gentiles, are sinners. And back in the opening three chapters, he made that very clear. And... Uh, Jews and Gentiles alike deserve God's wrath because we are all sinners. He also made it clear, chapters 3, 4, and through there, that righteousness, being right with God, uh, being declared forgiven and innocent, in other words, saved, is, is a result of faith. Not obeying the law, which God gave Moses, or through doing good deeds, the way a lot of people think about it, works of righteousness. And he uses Abraham as an example that Abraham was declared righteous by his belief, by his faith, and that God declared Abraham righteous by faith before God gave circumcision to Abraham and his descendants and before God gave the law to Moses. So righteousness existed before the law, before circumcision, before good works and good deeds and obedience, before religious ritual. Righteousness has always been by faith. That's not new. It's always been that way. And he makes the point in these chapters that only people who receive righteousness through faith are the true spiritual descendants of Abraham, are, are, are descendants of the legacy of Abraham. Yes, there are people who are blood descendants of Abraham. Some of them are Jews, some of them are not. But only those who are people of faith, who receive righteousness through faith, are the true uh, heirs of Abraham and therefore comprise true spiritual Israel. He also makes the point uh, in the middle chapters that God can use any person, any group, any people, any nation, any method, any means, any vehicle, any way he pleases to deliver salvation, to deliver the message of salvation to humanity. And that he uh, he did that with Israel, but now he also does it with Jews and Gentiles who are believers, i.e., true spiritual Israel, the church. Now, in Romans chapter eleven, in Romans chapter eleven, he he um, he says this deliverance of 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 God's love for people and salvation began with the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, but now it includes Gentiles who are doing this. Uh, all believers, whether Jews or uh, Gentiles. And he makes the point in chapter 11 that all the Jews who are going to be saved and all the Gentiles who are going to be saved um, will be saved, and that is the group that comprises true Israel, and that this is a mystery. The mystery is is that it has always been God's plan for Gentiles to be part of his people. And that's discussed even in the Old Testament with Hosea and Isaiah and others. That's the mystery. Now, with that overview, let's look at a few select verses, and and, uh, starting in, in chapter 11 at verse 1. Let's read the first six verses. He says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. God's not rejected uh, the Jews per se, 
For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, a blood descendant. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. God chose the Jewish people to be his nation. God didn't reject them. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? This is after the, the, the miracle on Mount Carmel. Verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets. This is Elijah talking to God about the Jewish people. They have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. And verse 4, what is the divine response? What did God say to him? He said, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal, the pagan god. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at this present time in Paul's day a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. In other words, not everyone who is a blood Jew is a true spiritual heir of Abraham and true Israel. In even the prophet Elijah's day, there were only a remnant of them who were true believers and therefore truly righteous. The majority were not. Paul makes it clear then that even in his day, in the days of the early church, the first century, the same thing was true, that it was only a minority, a remnant that were true believers and truly righteous. And that is true Israel. True Israel is not all Jews, not all blood Jews. True Israel is all people of faith who become righteous through faith. Then he goes on to use the example, if you will, the analogy of an olive tree with its roots, and the tree grows up and has branches. And that olive tree, its roots, its trees, and the tree and its branches were initially uh, Jewish. But God grafted some of them out, cut some of them out because of their unbelief, and has grafted others, i.e. Gentiles, into that olive tree because they are Believers, verse 17 and following, he talks about that. And in particular, look at verse 20. He said, quite right, they were broken off by their unbelief. So blood descendants of Abraham were broken off from the olive tree and no longer part of the family of God, the spiritual heirs of Abraham. Why? Because of their unbelief. And then he says to those of us who are Gentile Christians, but you stand by your faith. You were grafted in because of your faith. Therefore, don't be conceited, but have fear of God, reverence of God. We have been grafted into the tree because of our belief in Jesus, our faith in Jesus. And there's no need for any of us, Jew or Gentile, to be jealous of one another, to be arrogant toward one another, because all of us who are part of the olive tree of God's family are such because we have faith in Christ. In other words, you're, on the, you're part of the olive tree the same way. No, no one becomes part of the olive tree by works or law or circumcision or blood. Everyone, Jew, Gentile, becomes part of the olive tree because of their faith. That is what makes them righteous. And, and the, the point, one of the points he, he, he makes is that, uh, listen, not all blood Jews are going to be saved. Some of these branches are broken off. This idea that exists on the part of some um, who, who, who claim that at the end all Jews are going to be saved is so unbiblical and it's just not true. And that's... Uh, the climax of this argument that's been God's plan from the beginning that his one family, his olive tree, include, include branches that are Jewish and Gentile, and all those branches are part of the olive tree because of their faith, their faith, their faith, their faith. Not their blood, not circumcision, not their good deeds or obedience to the law, not baptism or anything else, but faith in Jesus Christ. He declares in here in verse 32 that God has declared, shut up, declared all of us to be sinners, and yet he's shown mercy to all of us, and that, uh, that, uh, that a Jew or a Gentile or anyone else who believes will be grafted into the tree. Now, two very important verses, verses 25 and 26. He said, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. And the mystery is that 
Jews and Gentiles are grafted into the tree, that God's people are, are both. A mix, it's a mix of Jews and Gentiles who are believers. Now, verse 25, I do not want you to be, you brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Don't be cocky or arrogant. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Um, and some people read that and say, "Well, there you go. All the Jews are going." No, 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 no. You can't. Li- you cannot lift a verse out of context and properly interpret it. When you do that, you you come up. You end up with erroneous teaching. The context of the book of Romans is that the true. Spiritual Israel, heirs of Abraham, are those of faith. And so there's this heart, this remnant of the Jews, because most of them are unbelieving, this remnant, some of them will be saying, what he's saying here, and I want to slow down so I don't so I say this clear. Let me just read my notes. The context is that the remnant of the Jews and the fullness of the Gentiles. That's what he's talking about. All Israel, in other words, when the second coming takes place at the end of time, the fullness of the Gentiles means that every Gentile who's going to be saved will have been saved, and all the Jews who are going to be saved will have been saved, and that is all Israel. That is all true spiritual Israel here. All the Jews and Gentiles who are going to believe and be saved, they are all Israel. They are true Israel. He said, as he said earlier in the chapter, otherwise grace and faith are made void, irrelevant. If every Jew is going to be saved simply because they have Abraham's physical bloods flowing through their veins, then faith means nothing. And the whole argument he's been making through these 11 chapters is that no one is righteous apart from Faith. That's the context. That's the teaching. Now, I could go on longer, but I think you've got the summation of it. In chapter 12, he switches gears and becomes practical. But you'll see how that practical teaching ties to the theology of the first 11 teaching, 11 chapters. And we'll look at that tomorrow. And thank you for bearing with me for this slightly longer than normal uh, uh, teaching. I hope uh, uh, this maybe helped you as you read chapter 11. You may want to go back and read it again now in light of what I've been saying. Hey, God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow.